Well, good morning. How's everybody? Good. Good to see you. Welcome to the Parkway Church. My name is Zach. One of the pastors here, hope that you are doing great. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 26. While you're turning there, I want you to think back to being in middle school and playing a little game called dodgeball. I don't know if you know about dodgeball. It's a great game. There's several fundamentals you have to learn, like how to duck and, you know, dip and dodge and dive and dodge again. And so there are all these fundamentals you need with dodgeball. It's a great game of fear and intimidation. And so think back to being on the playground in middle school, and they're picking teams for dodgeball. Typically what you do is you get two captains. Your captains are typically athletic, or they're the students that are more popular, and then they start picking, but you want to be the captain that gets the first pick. Why? Because you get the best dodgeball player. That first captain will pick that kid that's been held back for three years, He's like 6'8", and he's in middle school. His name is something like Brutus, and he'll get that kid first to help his team. The second captain thinks, oh man, they've already gotten Brutus. I've got to pick another kid. So he'll pick a kid that's still pretty athletic. Maybe he's quick. Maybe he's wiry. And then it comes down to this kid who's redheaded, eating donuts, named Larry, and you, right? Anybody been there? And you think, please don't pick Larry. Please don't let me be the last one picked for dodgeball. And then who do they pick? They pick Larry. And you're just left there. You're the last one on the dodgeball team. Well, when we pick a dodgeball team, we're trying to get the best players that we can because that will help us win. No matter how good your team captain is, they typically can't win by themselves. And so they want to pick people that will help their team, that will be excellent dodgeball players. Now, what we will find out in this text that when God picks his church, when God picks his dodgeball team, if you will, he does not pick the best and the brightest. He does not pick the most athletic because he needs nothing from us. He doesn't need our help. He is the team captain. And if we do anything, we just make his job harder. He will get all the outs. He will catch all the balls. He will do all the things to lead his team to victory. That the way that God picks the people that he's going to save, that he picks the church, is different than the way that the world picks its champions. So just to catch you up of where we are in 1 Corinthians, Paul's writing this letter to this church in Corinth, which is in Greece, and the church is a mess. They are sleeping around, and they're getting drunk, and they're doing all these kind of crazy things, and the first issue he's having to address is this issue of division and self-exaltation. The Corinthians are saying, I'm better than other Christians because look how progressive I am. Look how enlightened I am. They love philosophy. They love rhetoric. They want to be thought of as smart and culturally enlightened, and so they're exalting themselves. And Paul's going to say, when you do that, you're becoming the kind of person that is not who God chooses. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the wise. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the text. Dear God, we thank you so much for this text. We thank you for your word that you've not left us wondering who you are and what you have uh, done for humanity, but rather you've put it in black and white. So we pray that you would send the Spirit and he would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. We love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's look at verse 26. That's where we'll start. I love verse 26 because it's very comical to me. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. So he's saying, dear Corinthians, who think that you're so smart and you're so enlightened and you're so awesome, just look around. That's why it's funny. He says, okay, Corinth, look to your left. Look to your right. Idiots everywhere, right? (laughs) Consider your calling. Not many of you were great. You're all saying how great you are. And if you just look around, you see that that's not the case. Okay? When he uses this word here, calling, by the way, he means how God saved you. He's saying for those of you that are exalting yourself, if you'll simply look around and ask yourself, am I the cultural elites? Am I the best of the best? You'll realize that the answer is no, and that should bring humility instead of the pride that they have at Corinth. So let's do this. We have a bunch of smart people in here. We have a bunch of talented people in here, but let's see how many people in here are the true cultural elites, the people that the world would say are the best of the best. We're just going to do a little poll real quick. Raise your hand if you have a PhD from Cambridge. Go ahead. Other than Tony Fopp in the back, which has several, right? A PhD from Cambridge. Nobody? Okay. Nobody? No DPhils from Oxford? Raise your hand if you have ever been to the moon. Nobody? Come on, at least one person in here. Surely. No? Okay. Let's try another one. Raise your hand if you have a billion dollars. And please tithe, by the way. <laughs> that would help us out a lot. Any billionaires with a B? No. Okay, let's try another one. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're currently part of SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force. No, no CAG guys, no DevGrew guys? Okay, let's try another one. Raise your hand if you are a king, duke, or prince of a recognized country. Yeah, yeah. Gaba is the king of India, yes. 
That's it. <clears throat> Let's try athletics. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're in the NFL Hall of Fame. No? Nobody there with athletics? Raise your hand if you've ever been the president of Harvard. Okay. Me neither, right? As we look around, I'm the guy who tries to, when I get into the shower, to take my jeans off, tries to not use my hands and does this. That's who I am. I'm a guy who's eating candy with the wrapper on. I'm a guy who found out last year in 2020 that Bruce Lee was dead. I thought he just wasn't making movies. I didn't know he'd been dead for 47 years. My great-grandfather, Bruce Lee, I failed kindergarten. That's an actual fact. I failed. I don't know how you fail kindergarten. All you have to do is eat glue and you pass. But all the kids are lined up to go to recess, and I'm the only kid facing the other direction. And they think, you know what? He's not going to make it. All the kids are drinking out of the water fountain, and I put my whole mouth around the faucet. And I had to repeat kindergarten. So my parents said, Zach, you didn't repeat kindergarten. We just put you in pre-first. You know what pre-first is? Kindergarten. And the reason I didn't realize that verbal trickery is because of the failure of kindergarten. Now, what Paul is trying to do is he is trying to take these people who are these, they're exalting themselves. They're trying to find a way outside of Christ to make themselves look awesome. And he's saying, just look around. Look, God doesn't save just the best and the brightest. But I want you to see something in this text that I think is important, okay? It says, for consider your calling brothers. Look at that next phrase. It says, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. He's not saying none. Several early church apologists will point that out. God does save celebrities. He does save those who are bright. He does save those who are athletic. He does save those who are talented. So I need to give a little correction. The text is not saying God never does that. It just is not the majority. But there are some incredible people that God has saved and that he's used, if we just think about it even through church history, to be ordained a bishop. In Egypt in the fourth century, you'd had to have all of the Psalms, two of the major prophets, all of the Gospels, and all of Paul's letters completely memorized if you wanted to be a church leader. Jerome translated the entire Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin by himself. Augustine was a rhetoric professor in Milan before his conversion, had a broad education in the humanities. He combined Neoplatonism with the Bible and wrote over five million words. That's about the length of 90 doctoral dissertations. He solved the problem of evil, defended the doctrine of grace, proved the existence of absolute truth, and defended the Trinity. In fact, he studied the Trinity for 22 years before writing De Trinitate, his famous work on that topic. Thomas Aquinas studied at the best university, University of Paris, under the best teacher, Albertus Magnus, Albert, Albert the Great. His Summa Theologia is one of the most influential theological textbooks ever. He wrote over 8 million words, the equivalent of about 144 doctoral dissertations, and was so smart that he could dictate three to four books at a time. He'd have four scribes around him and start talking to one for one book, stop, start talking to another one for another book, stop, and just dictate four books at the same time. Martin Luther had his doctorate in theology. He was a professor at the University of Wittenberg, translated the entire New Testament from Greek into German in just 10 weeks by himself while locked up in a castle struggling with spiritual attack. He thought the biblical languages were so important that he would, quote, go to school with the devil to learn them and encourage Christians to study until, quote, they had taught the devil to death and become more learned than God himself and all his saints. John Calvin studied at the universities of Paris and Orléans and wrote one of the most famous, the most famous Protestant systematic textbook ever, Institutes of the Christian Religion. His first published work was at the age of 23, and it was a commentary on Cicero that he wrote in Latin. I don't know what you were doing at 23. Probably not as good as Calvin. Ulrich Zwingli had all of Paul's letters memorized in Greek. George Whitfield and John Wesley studied theology at Oxford. Jonathan Edwards went to Yale at 14, graduated with his bachelor's at 17, and had his master's from Yale before he was 20. He then became the president of Princeton. He sometimes studied 14 hours a day and is considered to be the greatest mind to ever come out of North America. Charles Spurgeon had a library of over 20,000 volumes, tutored Greek at Cambridge, and was reading the Puritans by the age of 12. Harvard, Yale, and Princeton were all started as Christian universities to train ministers. You used to have to know Greek, Hebrew, and Latin before you could even apply. The famous Baptist missionary, William Carey, translated the Bible in whole or in part into 35 different languages. So don't get me wrong. God does save sometimes the best and the brightest. But typically what God is doing is he takes someone who's broken, he takes someone who's a cultural nobody, and he saves them and then he equips them. And then he equips them. He gives these gifts of teaching and and hospitality and mercy and whatever it is for the equipping of his church. Now, what does this text mean when it uses these phrases? You'll see this phrase, wise, powerful, and noble birth. What do those words and phrases mean in this first 
uh, verse here. So let's talk about how the Corinthians are understanding it versus how we should actually understand it. Okay, so first of all, actual wisdom is a good thing. Let me say it stronger. You cannot be dumb to the glory of God. Did you know that? Actual wisdom is a good thing. Paul is not against actual wisdom. Every place in your life where you're thinking about something incorrectly is a place where you could be glorifying God more and are failing to do so. Actual wisdom is good. You should seek wisdom. You should seek knowledge. You should seek to be someone who knows. Wisdom is good. Actual strength is good. You should not try to be bad at stuff, okay? Whatever you do, you should do to the glory of God, which means that you do it and you do it well. Strength is a good thing. If God has given you strength, that is a gift. Here's another thing. Noble birth is a blessing. Noble birth is a good thing. Our culture thinks that privilege is bad and that is unbiblical. You can use privilege in a bad way. Privilege is a gift from God. That's why he gives some people 10 talents and some people five. That's why in the Bible, parents are commanded to save up an inheritance for their children to give them a leg up, to make life easier for them. Noble birth is a good thing and it is a blessing. You shouldn't despise privilege, you should rather use it to help those that are less fortunate. But it in and of itself is a good thing. It's what the Bible would call noble birth. All those things are good. Here is how the Corinthians are interpreting those. The Corinthians are not saying, Paul, I love Jesus and I just want to be wise. Paul, I love Jesus and I just want to be strong. They are defining those terms the way the culture does and here's how they would define it. By wise, what they mean is thought to be enlightened by culture. They mean tossed to and fro by the winds of culture. They don't mean actual wisdom. They mean what culture has said, this seems wise to us. By powerful, they mean influence. They mean influential in society. Are they a somebody? Are they a mover and a shaker? Okay? And then by noble birth, they mean having social clout. In the Greek world, if you were born into a wealthy family, you would have more influence and power and wealth. And typically, the courts would rule on your side. Okay, typically the courts would rule on your side instead of the side of the poor. And so what Paul is simply trying to say is when you are seeking after these things the way the world defines them, social status, influence, regrams, Twitter followers, whatever it is, trying to, trying to show yourself to be so enlightened and so above everybody else by following whatever is new and avant-garde, he is trying to say that is not the way Christ's kingdom works. Just look around. If you think that... The fact that God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise should encourage you. And if it doesn't encourage you, you maybe lack a little social awareness, okay? It should encourage you. Verses 27 through 29. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Let me just explain that phrase real quick. He's saying God takes the cultural somebodies and makes them nothing. And he takes the cultural nobodies and makes them something. That's his point of that. It's it's, it's in parallel to what he was just saying. Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. A few things I want you to see in this text. First of all, notice notice this repeated phrase, God chose. It doesn't say you chose, you chose, you chose. It is showing this theme of election. It is showing Calvinism, reformed theology, that God doesn't choose those who chose him first. The reason we choose God at all is because he chose us first. He is the one doing the stuff. If that wasn't the case, if we were really the ones that chose God first, this text would not be true. You would expect Paul to say 50% of the church are cultural somebodies because they all decided to follow Christ. What he's trying to say is if you look around at the church and you realize that God doesn't choose the best and the brightest, he chooses those that the world considers foolish, you see God's election. God wants people that are not awesome so that God gets all the glory. That's his point, okay? This was the case not just in the New Testament with all the language of election and predestination. It's also the case in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. God is talking to Israel and he says this. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Same kind of language, chosen. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, Listen to this, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loves you. So Israel has a tendency to think the reason God chose us is because we're awesome, and God is like, "Uh, the opposite is the case. I didn't choose you because you were the prettiest girl at the ball. I didn't choose you because you were the most numerous. Notice that God didn't choose Rome. He didn't choose Carthage. He didn't choose Babylon. He didn't choose Assyria. He chooses Israel. Why? Is there something great about them? No, they're very rebellious. He chooses them just because he decided to set his love on them. 
the reason for God's election is something in God and not something in us. It's just that he looks across the sea of damnable humanity and says, no one will follow me, so I'm going to save some. I'm just going to set my love on them. And that's what he does, New Testament, Old Testament, whatever. God doesn't love Israel because they're great. Israel is great because God loves them. Israel is great because God loves them. You see this in the New Testament. Who does Jesus hang out with? Does he hang out with the church people? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who are trying to be religious, the good Christian boys and girls? No, he hangs out with the prostitute and he hangs out with the tax collector and he hangs out with the sinner. So much so that people think, this can't be the Messiah, look who he hangs out with. And so you see the fact that God chooses the foolish things of the world. Not the greatest nation, not the greatest people, that's who God picks. God picks his dodgeball team the opposite way that we would pick ours. Christ gives an upside down kingdom. So I want to explain this because I think this will be interesting. It's hard to explain this with our culture because we're so influenced by Christianity, even our culture that's not Christian, is so influenced by Christianity. I want to contrast this with what Paul's audience would have assumed. So think back 2,000 years ago that you are a citizen living under the Roman Empire. Your view is that the gods don't love the poor. The poor should have used their money better. Your view is that the gods don't love the weak. The weak should work out. Your view is that the gods don't love those who are foolish. They love those who are scholars. You should have studied more. In Greco-Roman theology, both from the Greeks and the Romans, the gods love those who are awesome. Christianity, though, flips that on its head. It's an upside-down kingdom. If you want to be great, you have to become a servant. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. You don't hate your enemy, you love your enemy and you pray for them. What Jesus does is he brings an alternate way of viewing reality that is, that is just heads over tails different than what was going on in Greece. So to, to, to explain this to you, we're going to take a city that's near Corinth in Greece, a city called Sparta, and we're going to contrast that with Christianity so you can really see what Paul is saying. Let me give you some interesting things you need to know about Sparta because it is the best of the best. It is, uh, it is the cultural elite city. Let me just give you some things you might find interesting. First of all, if you were born in Sparta as a baby and you were at all deformed, they would kill you. They would leave you outside to die of exposure or they would throw you down a cliff. If you were already not well born, you had any deformities at all, they would instantly have you killed. Babies that didn't have deformities, your life was difficult from that start. They bathed their babies not in water but in wine to test their constitutions. They would not help them when they cried. They taught them never to be afraid of the dark. Spartan mothers were so tough that other Greek city-states would uh, hire them as nannies for their no-nonsense parenting, okay? So it starts very, when you're very different, when you're very little, it starts to be this elite society. We will only accept the best of the best. We will not have anyone who's deformed. A boy would live at home until the age of seven. He would then be sent off to a military training school called the Agoge. At that place, he would be starved. He'd have to steal food. And if he got caught, he'd be beaten. He would be beaten. Sometimes they were beaten to death, these kids, and encouraged to steal food. He would have to fight with other boys. He was given only a red Spartan military cloak to wear the entire year to learn to resist the cold. It, gets, it snows in Greece, by the way, just FYI. He would train there for the next 13 years before he could even enter the army. The boys would sometimes be whipped for an entire day. It was called this uh, test of endurance, and they would tie these boys down, and they would whip them for an entire day to see who was the toughest, to see who could take the most lashes. Obviously, several of these boys died because of those whippings. By the age of 12, you had to be able to survive in the woods without anything. You just throw them out in the woods, they have to find water, they have to find food, or else they die. This is by the age of 12. Young men, when you became a teenager, would be sent off to find the strongest helots. What are helots? They're Spartan slaves. To murder them to practice killing. So when you become a teenager, you have to go find the biggest, toughest slave, and you've got to kill him so that you can practice being an excellent warrior. Okay? In addition to all of this war and toughness, you also were very educated, and you were very enlightened. In addition to war, you would study math, reading, philosophy, astronomy, music, and more. Every 10 days, young men had to stand naked to be inspected. If they were not in excellent shape, they were beaten and censored. If you showed cowardice, you lost your right to vote and could not marry a Spartan woman. A Spartan woman had to train rigorously to have a strong, perfect body, which they thought would produce strong boys. A woman was treated like a military hero if she died in childbirth because that was her version of war. You see, men die by the sword, that's their battle. A woman dies in childbirth, that's her battle. She would be seen as this hero if she died giving birth to a Spartan. 
We all know of the famous Battle of Thermopylae where 300 Spartans, along with many other Greek soldiers, held off a force of several hundred thousand, okay? They are tough, they are strong, they are smart, they, they are better, they are, the, they are the elites. They're the best of the best, every single one of them. Two quick famous quotes from Spartans, which I think are fantastic. The first, Leonidas the first was an actual guy. His wife is named Gorgo, and she was a queen. And you didn't have that in every Greek city-state. You didn't always have queens. And so one time, one time a visitor did ask why she, as a woman, was allowed to help rule over men. And supposedly she really did respond by saying, because only Spartan women give birth to real men. Okay? King Philip II of Macedon sent a message to Sparta one time that said, you're advised to submit without further delay, for if I bring my army into your land, I will destroy your farms, slay your people, and raise your city. And the Spartans sent him back a one-word message that just said, if. These are the Spartans. They are strong, they are tough. It's fascinating. Even as I say that, some of you are like, we should be like Sparta, right? Some of you feel that. Now contrast that with Christianity. If there's a deformed baby, we don't kill it because that baby's still made in the image of God. That baby has inherent value. We help those who are weak. We help those in need. Physical beauty's fine, but what the Bible pushes for is an inner spiritual beauty. Toughness is good, but what the Bible's gonna push for is this resistance of temptation. Not just that you physically beat your body, that you spiritually resist what is evil. God chooses slaves and exalts them. He chooses women and exalts them. He chooses those that are social outcasts and exalts them. Now you start to see how shocking that message would be. What culture, what sinful man wants is everything I just mentioned. We want power and fame and glory and beauty and to be somebody and to be smart. And Christ's kingdom does the exact opposite. He says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the who? The humble. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. He chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the things that are not as though they are. Verses 27 to 28, let's read it again. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, the nobodies, to bring to nothing the things that are, the somebodies. I want to show you a piece of graffiti from the Roman Empire. I showed this during our theological equipping class. Uh, They're going to put it up on the screen. I've had Tim get rid of this. We've actually found this etched on a wall in the Roman Empire. It dates from somewhere between the first and the third century. And I had Tim just have it as a black and white outline so it's easier for you to see. It's actually scratched into this like marble wall. This is what is called the Alexamenos Graffito, okay? This is a piece of graffiti. You didn't know they had graffiti in the ancient world. You thought, where did their spray paint come from? They didn't use spray paint. They just scratched it into the wall, and this is graffiti that is anti-Christian. It's making fun of Christianity. It's mocking Christians. That text in Greek says, Alexamenos Sebate Theon. Alexamenos worships God. Supposedly, this guy, Alexamenos, is worshiping Christ, for he's a Christian, but what have they done with Jesus' head? What have they placed there? They've placed the head of a donkey. They're making fun of Christianity. This is anti-Christian graffiti from the Roman Empire making fun of this Greek guy for worshiping someone who's crucified. This is why the Bible says that the cross is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The idea that God would take on flesh and then the person of the Son would be crucified so that mankind might have salvation is just absolute insanity to the way the world works. We don't want that. Messiahs don't get crucified. Messiahs crucify. But what God does is he turns our expectations on its head. 1 Samuel 2, 4 through 8. This is called Hannah's song. It's similar to Mary's Magnificat in the New Testament. 1 Samuel 2, 4 through 8. Listen to the reversals here. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, meaning they don't have food. But those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven But she who has many children is forlorn. For the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Notice the reversal there. He takes the great and he brings them low. He takes the low and he makes them great. Now, a quick comment before we move on, lest you make this overly political. When Jesus exalts the poor or the oppressed 
or whatever it is, he defines those terms differently than our culture. Notice that the way that Jesus is involved in justice is not through rioting. The way Jesus is involved in justice is not through voting. The way Je- what does Jesus do? He preaches. He doesn't just love the poor, he converts the poor. He doesn't just love the oppressed, he converts the oppressed. You're not allowed to pursue justice apart from Jesus. That is an unchristian way of doing things. You don't get to just do it through secular means. You can do it some through secular means, but the main issue is the gospel. Because at the end of the day, if you give a poor person food and they go to hell, you've not done much. So notice here when it talks about raising people up, don't define that the way, the way our culture defines that. Define it the way the Bible would define it. Then look at verse 29. So that no human being, here we're given the reason why he chooses the foolish, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Odysseus glories in his cunning. Achilles, the swift-footed Achilles, glories in his strength. And what mankind wants to do is we want to exalt self. We want to glory in our status, our influence, our power. We want to be seen as enlightened. And the Bible is saying God will have none of that because he wants all the glory. When you see that he's chosen a terrible dodgeball team, you get to see what a great dodgeball player Jesus is because he has to do all the stuff. That's the point that he's making. Let me give you another analogy. First church I was at, I was the lead pastor of a little church up near the Red River. And uh, the youth pastor was taking the youth to camp. And he said, Zach, will you please go with me? There's too many youth. And I said, I will fall on that sword for you. I will do that. I will go with you to camp. So we go up to Oklahoma and there's this cabin that we're going to be staying in. And there's a ping pong table outside of the cabin. Now, you need to know for this story, I'm pretty good at ping pong. Not as good as probably Gaba or somebody else, but I'm good at ping pong, okay? So, I made a challenge to the kids, and I said this, like Goliath getting up in front of the armies of Israel. I stood up, and I said, you dare come at me with a stick. And I said, if any one of you can beat me at ping pong, one time, any one of you, me and the youth pastor will clean all the bunks, we'll clean the bathrooms, We'll clean up everything and we'll buy you guys Slurpees. When it's time to go, we'll do all the cleaning and you guys get to watch us clean while you have Slurpees. But, hmm, here's the kicker. But if I win and nobody beats me, we will drink Slurpees while we watch you clean up everything. Do we have an accord? Do we have an agreement? And they said, yes. And guys, the number of dead bodies of youth at the base of that ping pong table. I mean, I was slipping because of all the blood. I mean, it was, it was a slaughter fest. At one point it became too easy, so I just used my left hand. And then I thought, this is too easy, so I started to use implements that were not as good as a ping pong paddle. So I beat one kid using my Bible, not a hardback Bible, a floppy leather Bible. And I'm like, God's word is a sword in my hand. And I do all this, and I beat this kid using a Bible. And then I thought, that's too easy, so I played the next kid using a sandal. I beat him with a sandal. And at the end of the week, as I was enjoying my Slurpee, I was walking around the bunk and just dribbling a little bit of Slurpee everywhere. And I'm like, you guys missed a spot. Over here, you got to clean. Walk over here. You missed another spot over here. Now, here's why I tell you that story. When you're using an implement, a ping pong paddle can help you be good at ping pong. You can control spin. You can control speed. When you're using an implement that is not designed for that, it shows more skill of the ping pong player. Do you see where I'm going with this? When God is playing ping pong, to say it that way, he does not use implements that help him. He uses implements that are not good, that make his job harder, metaphorically speaking. Nothing's hard for God, but it makes his job harder, metaphorically speaking. That's why God does that. Why does God choose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise? So he gets all the glory. To beat someone with a ping pong paddle, the paddle helps. To beat someone with a sandal means you have the skill. That's what God is doing. Had I been God, I would have chosen Harvard grads and army rangers and professional businessmen and I would have taken over, that would have been my church. But that's not who Jesus chooses. He chooses these uneducated fishermen and he shakes the world through the gospel message. If you're a doctor and you remove a tumor with a scalpel, that takes skill. But if you remove a tumor with like, I don't know, a stick of gum, you must be a really, really good surgeon. And that's what God is doing. God is choosing the foolish things of the world because it means he gets all the glory. No one can say that the reason that the church has exploded and that people are getting saved and that people are meeting Christ is because of the talent talent of his agents. That's not the case. It is God doing the stuff. That is Paul's point, so that no one may boast. Verse 30, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus 
who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let me explain what verse 30 doesn't mean, then we'll explain what it does mean. Verse 30 is not saying that Jesus wasn't smart and then he got smart. Then he, then he became wisdom. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has always had wisdom. That's not what this text means. That's actually how the heretic, we actually talked about him, Jeff did in theological equipping. That's the way Arius, the heretic, that said that Jesus was not eternal, that's how he interpreted this verse. He said, Proverbs 8, 8 says that God made wisdom, and then 1 Corinthians calls Jesus wisdom, ergo, Jesus must be created. And the other early church fathers have to say, I'm sorry, are you st- taking stupid pills? Are you saying that God hasn't always been wise? God's always had wisdom. Whatever Proverbs 8 means, it doesn't mean that God is unwise and then he creates wisdom. And so they have to to fight that idea. That's not the point of this text. Here's the point of verse 30 to clarify. When it says that Jesus became wisdom, that means wisdom to us. Meaning true wisdom is knowing Jesus. That's what he's saying. It's important for you to know about metaphysics. It's important for you to know about reality and being and the difference between a substance and an accident, and uh, all these kind of things. That's important, okay? It's important for you to know about epistemology, what you can know, knowledge, justified true belief. That's important. But none of those things get you salvation. The most important thing for you to know is Christ and Him crucified. It's Jesus. True wisdom at the end of the day is knowing your Creator and being reconciled to Him through the blood of Christ. That's what this text is saying. That's real wisdom. That's the point. Jesus has always existed. He's always been wise. The idea is not that he became wise. The idea is that true wisdom is not what the Corinthians are exalting, not what the world would exalt, but rather knowing Jesus. And these terms here are meant to be in contrast to the earlier terms. The Corinthians are claiming to be wise and powerful and of noble birth. Instead, Paul is focusing on these other attributes, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And by the way, in this context, those all mean about the same thing, okay? This is where he's not trying to break down each of these words. I realize they're different words and elsewhere they have different meanings. Here what he's trying to say is true righteousness is knowing Jesus, which leads to the stuff you really need, which isn't worldly wisdom, but holiness, righteousness, salvation, forgiveness. That's his point here. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee says this, wisdom does not have to do with, quote, getting smart, nor with status or rhetoric. God's wisdom the real thing has to do with salvation through Christ Jesus. And there's another quote that's attributed to Augustine. He didn't actually say this. I wish he did. He didn't. But it's anonymous. But it's an excellent quote to explain what this text means by Jesus being wisdom. We're going to show it up there. It's by someone who's anonymous. This is a great quote. Listen to this. I have read in Plato and Cicero sayings that are wise and very beautiful. But I have never read in either of them, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's the point of what Paul is saying. Plato is a great philosopher. He says a lot of incredible things that Christians should listen to. Cicero, the great Roman rhetorician, is the standard of Latin Roman rhetoric. He's a great thinker. You should read him. You should know him. But at the end of the day, there's nothing so comforting to the soul of man is hearing that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me all that are weary, all that are heavy laden. That's true biblical wisdom. What the Corinthians are doing is they're trying to find their identity in, let let me ask it this way. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to ask you a very offensive question. I'm not doing this for shock value. I'm doing this to really just drive home the point as strong as I can. What is it that gives your life value, or to say it more strongly, why don't you kill yourself? Why is it that you continue living? At any point, you could kill yourself. Why do you decide not to? That's a conscious decision that you're making every day. Why is that? And if you start thinking through the reasons, you'll say, well, maybe because my family, I wouldn't want to leave them, and I've got a good job, and I want to do some fun things in life, and you'll start listing off all these things. The reason you shouldn't kill yourself, the reason your life has value, the reason you exist is because of the glory of God. It is because you belong to Jesus. That and that alone is why. The very reason you exist is to make God famous. That's your job. That's why you have breath in your lungs. And that and that alone is where you will find your identity. You will not find it in your kids who can betray you and become terrible. You will not find it in your spouse who can cheat on you and leave you. You will not find it in your money, which can be taken from you. You will not find it in your beauty, which will fade as you get older. You will not find it in your health, which will decline as you get older. Jesus is the only thing that gives your life meaning that can't be taken away from you. He must be your identity. 
We sing this song, My Worth is Not in What I Own, here at Parkway, and I want to show you a few of the lyrics here. One of these lyrics we don't often sing just to make the song not, you know, 90 minutes long or whatever, but I want you to see the different lyrics to this song here. My worth is not in what I own, not in money, not in possessions, not in the strength of flesh and bone, meaning my strength, my power, my prowess, my talent. My worth is not in skill or name. And being famous, people knowing who you are, that they can see your skill and you can maximize your potential in win or lose in pride and shame. Rome was a pride-shame culture. Christianity is not. We are a guilt-forgiveness culture. As summer flowers, we fade and die. Listen to this one. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. All those things that we pursue in our youth, they're eventually gone. I'll especially say this to the ladies. Whereas most men struggle with pride and lust, Most women struggle with body image, insecurity, et cetera. There's nothing wrong with being pretty. There's nothing wrong with pursuing those things. Do that. But at the end of the day, the most beautiful woman on earth thinks she could be prettier. The thinnest woman on earth thinks she could be thinner. At the end of the day, the problem is not physical, it's spiritual, that your identity is not in how you look. It's in that the God of the universe has adopted you and called you daughter. That's where you find your value. I will not boast in wealth or might, and I love this last line, or human wisdom's fleeting light. There it is for 1 Corinthians. Had it just said boast in wisdom, I would have objected to that song title, or that, that song lyric, because wisdom we should be pursuing. It adds the word here, human wisdom, as if to say the so-called wisdom of the world. That's what we don't rejoice in. Your identity is in Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great, but hear what I'm about to say, you have to define greatness the way the Bible does. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be great, you just have to define greatness the way the Bible does. It's a Christian virtue in uh, the history of Christianity called magnanimity. Magnanimity is great souledness. It's okay to want to be great, but you have to define it the way God does. Be great at being holy. Be great at knowing the Bible. Be great at serving others. Be great at putting sin to death. It's okay to be great. The problem is we just always define that in worldly terms. Being great, we think, means making a bunch of money and having a bunch of fame and everybody liking us. That would be sinful. That's selfish. That's the exaltation of you. Using your gifts to glorify God is the exaltation of God. Verse 31, almost done. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul almost certainly has in mind here Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God will not let you try to steal his glory. That's what we do when we sin. That's what we do when we exalt self. This is one of the reasons why I hate legalism. Legalism is the attempt to rob God of glory. It's the attempt to say, yeah, God saves me, but I'm going to try really hard and I I get to contribute. I get to have a part in this. That's why I hate Arminianism. This idea that you think that the reason that God chose you was because some future version of you chose him first. That is ridiculous. If that is the case, then you can look down when you're in heaven on the people in hell and just say, you should have been smart like me. Should have been a good decision maker like I was. You heard the gospel, I heard the gospel. The reason that I chose Christ and you didn't was just because I had a bachelor's degree. I'm a better decision maker, I'm a better thinker, that's why I'm saved. That's not how it works. If you are responsible for 1% of your salvation for all of eternity, you only get to give God 99% of glory. And God will not have that, which is why he is responsible for all of it. He does the choosing, he does the saving, he cleans you up, you're falling all over the place, getting hit by the dodgeball, and he's the one having to protect you and peg all the other kids, okay? That's how this works. God does not want us to be able to exalt ourselves so we have no part in our salvation, other than all the sin that made it necessary, no positive part in our salvation. God does all the stuff so that he gets all of the glory. The reason you chose Christ is because he chose you first out of his love like he did Israel. The reason you walk in holiness, which is a good thing, is only because the Spirit is doing that through you. You don't get to boast. You don't get to point back to self. So here's what I want to do. I want to end by leading us kind of through a time of corporate repentance. Because everyone in here wants to be thought to be a somebody by somebody. And so I want to ask some questions that are convicting so that we might repent. So that we might beg God for forgiveness and walk out of here forgiven 
cleansed, renewed. If you're a Christian, you're ultimately forgiven, but let's heal that brokenness that's going on in your heart when it comes to exalting self. Let me ask you a few questions about where you're finding your identity in worldly greatness. One, at what do you think you're better than most people? At what do you think that you're better than other people? You might be better than other people at certain things, but even that gift is given to you by God, so then it still gets back to the fact that it's all of grace. But this will typically let you know a place where you're exalting self. Here's another question. What do you most want people to know about you? What do you most want people to know about you? If you get a chance to explain who you are, what do you most want them to know about you? That's probably a place where you're exalting self, where you're trying to find glory in worldly praise. What topic do you default to in conversation. What topic do you default to in conversation? So you can talk about all the stuff you know. On what issue do you compare yourself with others? On what issue do you compare yourself with others? Is it looks? Is it smarts? Is it money? Is it social prowess? There's nothing wrong with being smart. Be smart. There's nothing wrong with being hot. Look at Jared Lawson. Be hot, right? Whatever you need. There's nothing wrong with that. Are you finding your identity in that, though, and seeking worldly fame and wisdom and glory instead of Christ? Listen to this one. Who are your heroes and why? Who do you want to be like? If you read a biography, who is that biography of and why? Who are your heroes? That'll tell you a lot about where you find your identity. What thing about you, if you lost it, would life not be worth living? That's why I asked that question earlier. Not for shock value. What is that thing that if you lost it, you would think life is not worth living because unless that thing is Christ, that is an idol. That is something that you have exalted in your attempt to rob God of glory. Maybe you're someone in here who's not a Christian. Maybe you're someone in here who's just checking us out. If that's you, your entire life you've been a glory thief. Your entire life has been lived for you. But Zach, I did a bunch of good things. Why? So you could feel better? So other people could see you as great? So you could see yourself as great? Even your good deeds are tainted by selfishness. And as Maximus says... In the movie Gladiator, the time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. That there will be a judgment. There will be a time where you stand before the throne of God. And your confession will either be Christ is my everything, he saved me, he forgave me, he's my value. Or you will say I spent my entire life glorifying self. God offers you a chance to repent today. To bow the knee, to trust Jesus and to be given a clean slate. Not only a clean slate up until now, but a clean slate forever. For all your sins, past, present and future to be forgiven you if you will but simply cry out to Jesus for mercy and ask him for help. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. Father, we come before you through the Son and by the Spirit and confess that you are great and that we are not. It is true that we have talented people here. It is true that we have smart people here, but we confess even that comes from you. We didn't decide in our mother's womb that we'd be good with money. We didn't decide in our mother's womb that we'd be intelligent. We didn't decide in our mother's womb that we would be strong or physically fit. Everything you have given is a gift, and we thank you for it. Would you help us see real wisdom versus worldly wisdom? Would you help us use our talents well? You can't be bad at stuff to the glory of God. But may we, if you've given us 10 talents in an area, may we make 10 more. But may we do it for your kingdom and not for ours. We confess that's hard. We want to exalt self. We want to be great. At the end of the day, we want people to clap as they chant our name. Would you forgive us because we are not worthy, but you are. It's for your glory that we pray. Amen.